Hey, this is Ricky Gantz with G220 Ministries and G220 Radio. You can find out more if you go down to www.g220 radio or G220 Ministries. I'm sorry, I'm trying to multitask. Go down to g220ministries.com. Uh, you can find out all about uh, the ministry. You can find out what kind of events we have going on. We've got a lot of stuff upcoming, uh, evangelistic opportunities. Uh, Flood the Sidewalk is coming up in August. And so uh, if you want to join us for any of those events, uh, make sure you register at www.g220ministries.com. And if you go to the uh, events or outreaches there, you'll see registration as well. Uh, you can re register for the events that uh, you'd like to uh, come and join us with. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to talk about the sovereignty of God in the book of Acts. Really, I'm only going to get to a little bit here. That's why I'm titling this part one. Uh, I just got done with family devotion with my, my children, with my family, and uh, we was kind of looking through the sovereignty of God in Acts. Just some things that I was reading today. Uh, going through it. I only got through to chapter four uh, because there's so much there. Uh, and so then I was able to sit down with my kids and kind of going through uh, the sovereignty of God. And so I want to I want to highlight some things. Obviously, when you are reading scriptures, you want to read scriptures in their context. You don't want to just proof text uh, what we see from a lot of cults, false religions like the Hebrew Israelites or Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons is they do a lot of proof text. They will take a verse that doesn't have any meaning uh, to what it's actually portraying in Scripture to try to make it say something that it's not. So you don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you uh, not to proof text in that way. But what I'm doing here is going through some scriptures uh, that I was highlighting that just show the sovereignty of God in the book of Acts. It's kind of a study that I'm doing. And then, like I said, I'm sharing that with my my family as we did that for our devotion tonight. But um, so you can look at these scriptures that I, I point out and I'm going to talk a little bit about them. But I would encourage you to go and read the book of Acts. Go and read uh, chapters one, two, three, four, and just go through the book of Acts and uh, really see the sovereignty of God laid out in, in the book of Acts. And so I don't know how long this is going to be. Hopefully it won't be too long for you if you want to stick around and and listen and uh, watch the video here, but uh, just something that, uh, like I said, uh, having conversations and going back and forth with people uh, over the issues of the sovereignty of God when it comes to salvation, uh, dealing with the doctrine of election, dealing with God predestin predestinating uh, those to be sons. Uh, it, it's, it's something that, you know, when you're going back and forth with it and people are bringing certain things up, you know, it made me want to go into the book of Acts and just say, you know what, let me let me start from the beginning and read through this and highlight and underline things where I'm seeing the sovereignty of God on display. OK, now maybe there's more. Maybe there's things in here I've missed in the sovereignty of God on display here. Uh, and so maybe if you see something that I, I don't bring out in these first four chapters, uh, please let me know. I mean, uh, I would love to see more of God's sovereignty in the scripture, it's there. What I mean by see more of it is sometimes we can read scriptures and read a passage over and over and over again, and then the Lord illuminates something later on. You know, not gives us new revelation because I don't believe we get new revelations uh, from God or a new revelation from God. Scripture is complete, 66 books. But sometimes God illuminates that to us. So something we may have read a passage multiple times and then God illuminates it that we understand something that we had read many times but didn't didn't quite grasp it properly or didn't really get the full understanding of it. And then he illuminates it uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit in us revealing truth. And we're just like, wow, I, I can't believe that that's there as many times as I've read that uh, just today. Uh, in the Lord's Day here at church this morning, my pastor was preaching on on Genesis and he was talking about Noah uh, in chapter nine, where uh, Ham sees the nakedness of Noah. And he's going through this and explaining some things. And I'm like, man, how did I never see that before? I, I went to look and see if uh, that sermon was up that I could post it. It, it wasn't up yet. Uh, but as soon as it is up, I will share it so that you guys can hear that sermon, because I was like, man, I. I don't think I've heard anybody preach on that before and bring that stuff out. And so I love my pastor. I love the church where I go to, Good Reformed Baptist Church, ARPCA. Shout out to them. And so um, 
I hope that, uh, you know, going through this, you'll desire to go into the book of Acts, which is just all of Scripture. It is, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to open up the Bible and to go through it. But what I'm trying to do, like I said, is go through the sovereignty of God. And I'm, I'm titling in this part one uh, because, again, I don't, I don't know how far we'll get. Uh, well, I know how far we'll get tonight, but I don't know how far we'll get uh, through each time. So I'll just title them in parts, right? So trying to get through the book of Acts. And uh, Lord willing, I will be able to continue this uh, just for my own study, personal study, and then, you know, with my family for devotions. And, and then share that with you here, some of the things that we're going through. Now, this... Again, like I said, you got to read things in context. You want to read the scriptures. So I encourage you, again, go and read uh, the book of Acts. All right. So the first thing that stood out to me as I'm looking for the sovereignty of God in this uh, is verse 24 in chapter 1. And it says, And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen. Now, the, the reason this stands out to me is, is if you understand, Judas had betrayed Jesus Christ. He betrayed him. Uh, he was one of the 12. He was not an, of the elect. Uh, he was chosen for a purpose to bring about and fulfill God's plan. He was a betrayer from the beginning. But he was chosen for that purpose uh, to do and bring about what God had already ordained and decreed to happen. And so the disciples are gathered together and they are um, looking at who's going to replace Judas. The, Peter stands up and he's talking to him. He says, look, there, there was 12 of us for a reason. Judas is a betrayer. Uh, and so we need to fill this spot. We need to, to have another disciple here. We need to have another uh, one of the 12, one that walked with us. And, and I think when you look at this, you see the sovereignty of God in the fact that the, the disciples understood God's sovereignty. They understood it wasn't them just deciding, hey, let's pick this person to be in this position. They're looking to God knowing that he is sovereign and who is it that he will choose to be in this position, to be one of the 12, okay? And so we see the God's sovereignty there uh, when it comes to him making this choice of who will fill that position. Uh, also in, well, going into chapter two, looking down to verse 23. Uh, but even before we get there, looking at verse 22, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to, to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. And then he says, This Jesus, okay, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So, so, so this is according to God's definite plan. This plan is going to happen according to his foreknowledge. And, and, and foreknowledge, if you uh, do a study on foreknowledge of God, it's not God looking down the corridors of time and saying, okay, I see what this person's going to do. I see what that person's going to do. I'm going to use that to make it work out towards what I would like to accomplish. That's not what, what the foreknowledge of God means, okay? God is not looking down the corridor of time to try to decide what he's going to do. God is impassable. He is immutable. He's not changing. He's not reacting based upon the things that we are doing. Okay. However, all right, a lot of people's arguments against Reformed theology is that, well, if God is uh, created us and we have this sin nature and we cannot choose God in and of our own ability. Uh, we cannot do right by God. We can't have faith in God of our own ability, of our own choosing or doing. Then how are we responsible, right? Not understanding that those of us who hold to Reformed theology understand that it is God who works in us, and yet we are still responsible for our actions and for our deeds. And we see this here in verse 23, because he says this plan, okay, this definite plan, this is according to God's definite plan and foreknowledge. But then he says, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So you see the sovereignty of God in his decree that this is going to take place. 
and yet he uses the lawless deeds of man not because he didn't know about it not because he was looking down because he ordains this to happen he decrees all things he is the first cause of all things if you if you've listened to uh, when we did the show on of God's decree uh, in chapter 3 of the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. You can go back and listen to that show and get a better maybe understanding of, of the first cause and the second cause. God decreeing the ultimate end, but then he has means and he uses those means and those means uh, are also including the evil acts and intentions of man to bring about his purpose. Uh, we see this, uh, my brothers brought this out in a video the other day they were doing in a response to some of the anti-Calvinistic uh, things that are going on. But y you talk about Joseph. Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. You know, they hated him. They wanted him gone, right? Sold into slavery, goes into Egypt, and he's in first he's in Potiphar's house, then he's thrown in prison, and then Pharaoh brings him up to be like the number two man in Egypt. And when his brothers come into Egypt to get food because of the famine in the land, they see that uh, Joseph is still alive and they're worried. He's going to retaliate against them for what they did to him. But what we end up seeing is Joseph says to them, you, again, they're responsible for their actions. You meant this for evil, but God intended this for good. All right. So God had a plan and a purpose, a decree to send Joseph there to bring about the, the saving of his people because of this famine in the land. He was going to bring it about to save and, and, and bring forth that, that line that would continue to come to bring forth ultimately the seat of the woman who is Christ. Okay. They meant it for evil, but he meant it for good. And so we see that here, this delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God you crucified and killed by the hands of the lawless men. So you see that there, the sovereignty of God, and yet still man's, man being responsible for their actions. And, and even we see in, in Romans 9, Paul uh, addressing the fact that the, the arguments that people are going to bring out and say, well, well, if God made us like this, why are we to blame? And then Paul saying, who are you to answer back to God? Who are you to respond to God in such a way to say, well, you made me this way, so it's your fault. You know, as, as God says to Job, he's like, were you there when I laid the foundations? Were you there when I created all of this creation? You know, who are we to answer back to God? Does not the potter have the right to do with the clay what he wants to do? And so we see the sovereignty of God and yet the responsibility still of man. I don't know any Reformed theologian that would argue that man is not responsible for their sinfulness. I don't know anybody that would say that. I know that's the arguments that people love to bring uh, against us, but that is not what I know anyone would say. Okay? So we see the sovereignty of God here, and then we, we look to uh, further on in verse 37. And we'll go back to verse 36 again. I encourage you to go and read the book of Acts and see the sovereignty of God throughout this book when it comes to dealing with man. It says, let all those or let the, all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Again, he's telling them, look, this Jesus, we see it's God's plan, but you are still responsible for your sinfulness. Now he says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Now, why do I want to bring that out? Because there are, and, and we go out on the streets and preach the gospel. So there are people who you will sit there and you'll talk to and you're sharing the gospel with and you, you have two people standing there and, and one may respond to the gospel being uh, presented to them and the other will just blow it off and continue to rebel and reject it. Why is that? Why is one... Um, responding and the other one continuing to reject. Okay, why why does that happen, right? That's that's the question, right? What why does one respond and the other reject? And the scripture here, we look at this, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart why? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This is the 
the, the message in which God uses, the means in which God uses to bring conviction to people by the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting them, pricking them, cutting them to the heart, that they would then respond to Peter and say, uh, brothers, what shall we do? I mean, we're hearing this message. We've been cut to the heart. This conviction has come upon us. What shall we do, brothers? What shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, it says here also, in verse 39, it says, for the promise is for you. Now, Peter's talking to all these Jews that have come here for the Pentecost, and and they're there, and he's preaching on this day. And he says, for for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Okay? And so it's for you, it's for your children, and all who are far off. Now, does that mean every single individual in the world will be saved, will be called, will be justified? No, it doesn't. You have to look at Scripture as a whole and understand, like systematic theology is taking taking all of Scripture and looking at salvation and looking at certain things to, to try to understand what Scripture says as a whole of that, okay? But the very same verse here tells us, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off. Everyone. So you could say, well, let's see, it's for everyone. Whom the Lord, our God, calls to himself. Whom the Lord, our God, calls to himself. I mean, that, that, is, that is pretty clear in Scripture here that it's the promises for, for you, he's saying, for your children and those far off. We know the Gentiles are, it's always been God's plan. For the Gentiles to come in. Okay. To be a part of this church. And so. He's saying everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Everyone who the Lord calls to himself. And we know in John 6. The Bible tells us that. uh, No one can come. To Christ. Unless the father draws him. All that the father gives. Jesus will come they will be raised up on the last day the reason that uh, John 10 I believe John 10 the reason that they do not believe is because they are not his sheep his sheep hear his voice and they come all right so everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself will receive this promise and we see in Romans chapter 8 that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Those whom he predestined, he also calls. Then what happens to those who are called? They're justified. Those who are justified are then glorified. And there's this process, this, this uh, order of, we call it the order of salutis, the, the order of salvation. Okay? When, when is one justified? In that order, in that process. Are they justified and then they're predestined? Are they justified and then they're called? No, the Bible says they are foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. That's what we call the order of salutis. At the very end of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Lord added this number to the church. It was not man adding this number to the church. The Lord added to the church day by day. You see, today in in American evangelicalism, you have all kinds of pragmatism that takes place. You have so many programs and so many things that man tries to do in an effort to win people to Christ, to get people to come into the church. To get people to get saved. 
and here the Bible tells us that in this, and you got to think about this in the context too, right? The Jews coming to Jesus Christ is not like bouncy houses and trunk or treats and, you know, these types of activities and programs and, and pragmatism that's used today. These men coming to Jesus Christ and, and believing that he's the Messiah would cost them everything. It would cost man sometimes their families because they would turn on them. It would cost them their their jobs and being able to provide for their family, people not wanting to sell them or let them buy anything because of their beliefs in Jesus. That Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, coming and died. He's the Messiah. And it can also cost them their life. Put them in prison or cost them their life, which we see happens to all of the disciples. They all die for Christ. John, boiled alive, doesn't die, then is exiled to the Isle of Patmos for their faith in Jesus Christ. Right? And so there's much that they would suffer. It's not like the, the American church today that tries to offer uh, so much to come follow Jesus. You know, and they use all these pragmatic methods and means to try to bring people in. But we see the sovereignty of God. He adds to the numbers day by day. He was adding to their numbers there who were being saved. Okay. And then in chapter three, uh, in verse 15, it says, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses and his name by faith in his name has man has made this man strong whom you see and know. Now, a little context. This is where Peter uh, is speaking to, or in Solomon's portico, where this he raises this blame beggar and, and gives him the ability to walk, okay? Not Peter, but through Jesus, all right? And so he's speaking to them about this, and he says, and the faith that is through Jesus, I'm going to say the faith that this man has in Jesus, this man was just told to rise and walk in the name of Jesus. So this faith through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. All right. Oh, I'm getting a little distracted here. Things happening over on this other screen. So he says, has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. And then in verse 18, it says, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. You see, every everything that God has foretold by the mouth of his prophets, he fulfills it. Everything that God decrees, he will bring it about. Everything. You see, again, I said we've done the show on of God's decree, chapter 3 of the 1689. And we've also done the show on God's providence, uh, which I believe is chapter 5 of the 1689, Second London Baptist Confession. Uh, pretty sure it's 5. I could be off, but uh, chapter 5. And you can go and listen to those, those programs and understand the providence of God, the decree of God, um, maybe get a better understanding of it, uh, working yourself through the confession of 1689. Uh, not that we hold the confession higher than Scripture, but uh, everyone has, to some degree, a statement of faith or something that they believe. Uh, and I don't think there is a more precise uh, statement of faith other than one of the confessions. If you are holding to the Westminster Confession, the Savoy, uh, the 1689, the Philadelphia, these confessions, you're not going to find today confessions that are as detailed as these confessions and these confessions help and keep you in line from going outside of the biblical bounds and into heretical teachings uh, and so the, it's not that the confessions are above scripture but the confessions are uh, explaining what we believe based upon the scriptures so uh, continuing on then in um, in this chapter here verse 3 or chapter 3 
uh, at the very end of this chapter, uh, halfway or towards the end of, of verse 25. Actually, I'll read 25 for you. It says, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, he's saying this to Abraham, and he talks about the blessing. He says, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, meaning Jesus, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. See, again, this is the sovereignty of God. He has blessed us by turning you from your wickedness. This is not you turning yourself. This is not you finding the faith within yourself. What's up, Adrian? How you doing? Adam, love you, brother. And so th this is not, uh, again, you being able to turn. Sometimes we're out on the streets or we go to the Derby or we go to different places to preach the gospel and you run into these Pelagian street screamers, not really preachers. And they tell people to stop sinning and come to Christ. Stop sinning. And you, you, you try to have a conversation with them to say, okay, maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding what they're saying. Are they saying, you know, like turn to Jesus Christ and repent of, you know, repent of your sins, which is a turning away from that. It's a change of mind. Uh, what are they saying? But what they're saying is stop sinning. You can stop sinning of your own ability. You got to humble yourself first. Then God will accept you. That's not the message of scripture. That's not the message that God gives to us. You can't stop sinning. You can't turn away from your own wickedness. It's a sovereign work of God by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And you can go check out the video that I did uh, the other day dealing with uh, John chapter 3. Well, actually, it was dealing with John 6, 40, or spe specifically with John 6, chapter 6. Uh, but I, I mentioned in there about John chapter 3 when it talks about the spirit, you know, moving as he will, a man being born again, which is regeneration. You can go in. And look at that. Unless God regenerates a man's heart, a heart interchangeable with the mind in Scripture, you know, that's why we say the renewing of the mind. That's what we say the well, we see in Scripture, um, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Uh, it's interchangeable there. And so uh, we see this. It, he comes to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Now, obviously, that's not talking about every single individual because not every single individual is turned from their wickedness. Not every single individual goes to heaven. Not every, not every single individual is saved or will be saved. There is hell. Even though there's people that deny that, there is a hell. And death and hell will be cast into this eternal lake of fire which burns forever and ever. There's no end. Revelation 20, it's, it's, it's prepared for Satan and his angels but it also is the place where those who die in their sins, liars, thieves, fornicators, blasphemers, idolaters, will spend their, their part in the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And they'll spend all of eternity there. And so, you know, again, it is Christ by faith through the grace of God that saves a man. But that regenerating work does happen first i know again people love to get into this debate over this and and it's easy to i i get wrapped up in it sometimes because you, you you're passionate about the word of god you're passionate about truth and you want to rightly give god the glory not man it's not me and having faith within myself to turn and believe in jesus christ it's a sovereign work of god you know, I mean, you look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says it's by grace through faith. And then verse 10 says we are his workmanship, which he's prepared before for us to walk in this. All right, Ephesians 1, 4 tells us he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 5, talking about us being predestined to sons in this adoption, to predestined to adoption as sons. As I already mentioned, Romans 8 talks about the order of salutis there those who he foreknew he predestines he calls he justifies he glorifies it's a work of the sovereign god of the universe and we want to give him glory 
for what he is doing. And in chapter four, you know, uh, verse 12, it says, there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He's the only one that can save. A Buddha cannot save you. Allah cannot save you. Hare Krishna cannot save you. The thousands of other Hindu gods cannot save you. Your atheism cannot save you. Darwin cannot save you. No one can save you other than Jesus Christ. Salvation is in no other name. Man must be saved through Christ and Christ alone. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There, no one comes to the Father except through him. And as I said in John 6, it tells us that no one can come to him unless the Father draws them. It's a work of God from beginning to end. He not only justifies us, but he sanctifies us. It's a work of God. And yet we're still responsible for our actions. We still have a part to play in this. We are still responsible to study, to show ourselves approved, and to walk in holiness, and to walk in this, uh, uh, walk towards perfection in, in the growth of sanctification. We are to, to add to our faith, as it says in Peter. So we have responsibility, but yet it is still a work of God that he is doing in us and through us. And so in, in, in chapter 4, as I said, you know, salvation is in no other. There's no other name under heaven by which man must be saved but through Jesus Christ. Uh, we go down to verse 27. After he's, he's going through, um, Peter and John are there before the council, um, leading up to, you know, the believers gathering together to praying for boldness. Uh, he goes in quoting from Psalms 2 of why do the nations rage or why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain. And then verse 27, he says, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. So he's saying in this city here in Jerusalem, they were gathered together against your holy servants. And like I said, they're praying. And they said, whom you anointed, Jesus, who, who's, who you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. So you've got Herod, you've got Pontius Pilate, you've got these Gentiles, which is these Romans who played a part in, in putting Jesus Christ to death on the cross, and the people of Israel. All of these, these individuals mentioned here played a part in putting Jesus Christ to death on the cross. They're responsible for that. And yet, it says in verse 28, to do, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So they're responsible for their actions. God is not causing them to do it. But yet it is in God's decree that they would do this to bring about what he has planned and predestined to take place in putting Jesus Christ to death on the cross, to die for the sins of all those who would put their faith and trust in him. I mean, we are seeing the, the sovereignty of God on display in how he deals with man. No one can come to Christ no one can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. No one can come to Christ unless they have been given to Christ by the Father. The reason people do not believe, ultimately, and to the end, to the, to the final end of this, when we stand before God in judgment, those people who do not believe, the Bible tells us in, in John 10, because they are not his sheep. Because Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they come. But we preach the gospel to all people because we do not know who the elect are. We do not know who God's sheep are. So we preach to all. We proclaim the gospel to all. The Bible says, as I said, his sheep hear his voice and they come. 
when you stand out on the on the streets or you're standing and talking to somebody and you're giving the gospel it may be in your voice but if they are God's elect his sheep hear hear his voice and they will come he uses the gospel the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe Romans 1 Romans 10 how will they hear this message without a preacher Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, again, what, what, what people don't seem to want to grasp when they argue against Reformed theology, especially when they're arguing specifically against the doctrine of election or when they argue against the order of salutis, how regeneration precedes faith. And they want to say, well, no, faith precedes regeneration. Is that God is doing a work in man and bringing about his decreed plan from all of eternity, his purposes, his will, he's bringing it about. And that shouldn't cause us to be prideful in ourselves and think, look at this, this faith is within me. I'm, I'm producing this faith. That should cause us to fall on our faces before God in praise and thankfulness that he would save a sinner like me. That he would, by his grace, work in my heart and intervene that I might believe and have eternal life in him. That should bring us to praising his name. Rather than wanting to hold on so tightly to the free will of man that we would say in and of ourselves, hey, I played a part in this. I believed. And then Jesus Christ saved me. It is Christ who does a work in us that we would believe. I mean, that's what I've been been looking at so far in, in Acts. Uh, that's why I labeled this part one. And uh, I hope to continue to go through this, but uh, I want to encourage you, go through the book of Acts and just look at the sovereignty of God uh, in Acts. Um, you'll find the sovereignty of God all throughout Scripture, uh, but uh, check it out in the book of Acts there and and uh, study it and read the book in context and read uh, all of scriptures in context. But uh, let's not let's not take away from the sovereignty of God. Let's not take away from his uh, immutable, impassable grace and mercy and his wisdom and his his perfect knowledge. Let's, let's not take away from his righteousness and his holiness his, his omnipotence, his omniscience. You know, we, we don't want to take away from the attributes of God, his characteristics of, of who he is. We don't want to take away from that. God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. He's sovereign over all things. He's in control of all things. Uh, hopefully you, you've seen some of that here as you're going through the book of Acts. Uh, the sovereignty of God in how he deals with and reacts with men, to men. So again, I want to encourage you, just go through the book of Acts, read it. You know, if you can sit down and read the entire book uh, in one sitting, you'll really get a great picture and understanding of what's being said. Uh, you ultimately, uh, maybe this can be helpful to you uh, when you're reading scripture. Try to read through it. Read through the whole thing so you get the broad context. And then go back and kind of go through parts of it to try to understand better. Because um, you want to get the big picture. You don't want to just pick and choose little things here. Now I know, again, somebody could come and say, well, that's what you was doing here. You were picking out verses. Yes, like I said, I was reading through this. And I did this tonight with my, my, my family for devotion. We were just kind of going through the book of Acts, looking at the sovereignty of God in the book. And um, so I, I had already gone through and read this prior to having the devotional time with my family and just highlighting and under under 
lining certain things that I wanted to bring out to them as we did our family devotion. And so, you know, you want to get the big picture, read the book, and then break it down into smaller portions that you can go back and study it and see, you know, what you're, you know, whatever you're trying to uh, study through that book. And then here, in this case, looking at the sovereignty of God uh, in the book of Acts. And so this is definitely longer than I, I thought it would be. Um, so I'm going to get off here uh, and go spend some time with my wife and pray and probably talk about this and, and get ready for bed and start a new day. I hope you had a wonderful Lord's Day. Um, so uh, God bless you and uh, good night.